Hello, everyone. Uh, so, first of all, thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is Julia. I am part of Cell Guidance System team. And today we're really excited because we're hosting our first webinar on exosomes uh, with the help of Professor Alid Clayton. Um, so, this webinar was really important to us because Cell Guidance System is an exosome expert company. So, we developed a large range of products for your exosome research. And as I know that one of the key steps in any exosome research project is the purification of uh, functional exosomes, I just wanted to show you really briefly uh, our um, large uh, project range of exosomes. So for example, we have uh, exosome isolation kit, but we have also detection kit, tracking, and we also offer NTA services. Um, and so we have a kit named Exospin for the exosome isolation, which combines two really powerful methods, which is the precipitation and the size exclusion chromatography in order to allow an excellent yield and a really high level of purity. There is also no ultra centrifugation required. And it's a really simple and reliable protocol. So if you're interested to know more about this product, uh, please go to our website at cellgs.com or you can also send me an email directly as my email address is available on this platform. So now um, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Alid Clayton from the Tissue Microenvironment Group uh, from School of Medicine, Cardiff University, who is going to talk about extracellular vesicle uh, and their role and potential utility in cancer. So if you have any questions, you can ask them on the chat and we will answer them uh, at the end of the presentation. Thank you. So thank you, Julia, for the kind introduction and for the invitation for me to talk to you today a little bit about vesicles in cancer. So as we know, cells are very complicated in how they work and they expel a whole variety of different factors into the cellular secretum. These can be very small molecules and they can also include larger structures. Um, and it's these larger structures that we're really interested in. There's a real diversity in different types of structures that a cell can produce. Some of them are displayed in this um, schematic here. Um, some of these are quite exotic things, um, which are very extensively studied. These may include vesicle structures related to cell migration or very large oncosomes. But the most common categories that people may come across in the literature are the microvesicles, which are derived from the plasma membrane, and also a whole bunch of very small vesicles, which are made inside the endosome compartments of the cell. These are, by, these are made, trafficked, and secreted to the extracellular space, and they do things. So the microvesicles, you can see in panel A here, we have a prostate cancer cell that we've sectioned thinly, and there isn't a single region of that cell membrane which is flat and smooth. There's a whole bunch of activity in relation to budding and ruffling going on constitutively in these cells. And in panel B, you can see here a very nice example of a bit of plasma membrane that is budding, forming a stalk, and is about to be pinched off as a genuine vesicle. So some of these are quite big, up to around half a micron big in diameter. The one shown here is around 200 or so nanometers. But just above it, there's another little vesicle. This one is around 100 nanometers in diameter, arising from the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane is really complex and that it can make big and small vesicles and it's very difficult for us to decide where the vesicle has come from just by looking at its size. It's not enough information. The other major category of vesicles that people study are those which are made in the late endosomes within multivesicular bodies or multivesicular endosomes. So panel A and B show very beautifully here the structure of an endosome, which is pre-filled with little vesicles. In A, this multivesicular body is fusing with the plasma membrane and expelling hundreds of these beautifully um, small spherical structures into the extracellular space. 
and similar for B. For A and B, these are stained with amino gold antibodies, and if you look where the antibodies actually are, it's amazing how focused the labeling is to the vesicles. So even though the membrane of the vesicles has derived from the limiting membrane of the endosomes, there's hardly any labeling there. There's hardly any labeling on the plasma membrane. So really that's quite striking because it tells us there's a whole bunch of molecular machinery is involved in that multivesicular body to grab hold of molecules, select for them, and enrich them into the small vesicles in readiness to be secreted. And these things are diverse. In panel C, I have an example there of four vesicles which are about the same size, around 100 nanometers or so in diameter, but they're all different. So the one on the left has a single thin um, monolayer membrane structure, but the cargo that looks very empty, the one on the extreme right, appears electron dense. The one above that seems to have two little vesicles within the boundary of the big vesicle. The one at the bottom seems to have a membrane with stuff stuck onto it. So there's a huge diversity both in terms of size, structure and molecular cargo in relation to the vesicles expelled by a given cell. Another thing we need to consider, I think, when discussing or thinking about vesicles is that as well as the machinery inside the cell responsible for manufacturing and secreting these things, the cell is always listening out for environmental cues. And the environment can have a huge influence on vesicle output. And these um, stress factors, if you like, of well-documented evidence showing that they can influence the types of vesicles being produced at any given moment in time. An example in A shows a study from us a very long time ago now. We were looking at heat stress response in B cells. If you stress them, they seem to dump certain heat shock proteins into the vesicle in a quite a selective fashion, and they also make more vesicles. So when we think about vesicles, the repertoire of vesicles being made, we have to be aware that these are highly dynamic systems. What we study today may be very different from what the cell is making tomorrow. This makes studying these things very challenging. Another major aspect of considering vesicles is we should think about how they are interacting with the recipient cell, um, forcing that recipient cell to respond. Um, and this can happen in many different ways. The simplest way is shown in A, where you have a delivery of a ligand to a receptor, and that ligand receptor interaction triggers a signaling cascade in the recipient cell. And I'll talk a little bit about that a bit later on. But I think that's really simplistic because the vesicle is carrying a whole bunch of ligands and may be able to deliver these in concert at the same time to multiple receptors on the recipient cell. And it's probably going to deliver parallel signaling pathways in the recipient. Um, I don't know whether that's been formally shown, but it'd be su really surprising if that didn't happen. And I'm happy for the audience to correct me if indeed that has been formally shown. Once the vesicle has bound to the recipient cell, it can't stay there forever. The cell has to handle that. So what tends to happen is that we see the vesicles are internalized in some fashion by the recipient cell. Usually this is by a form of endocytosis. And the uptake of vesicles can result in some processing of those vesicles, releasing RNA, for example, into the endosomal compartment. And then we have toll-like receptors which can engage with those RNAs and instigate signaling. So you can have signaling from within an endosomal compartment that has received vesicles. And then that vesicle cargo may want to be delivered to the cytosol. So we have this concept of endosomal escape where RNA in a vesicle which is received seems to find its way to the cytosol, although the details of that escape mechanism hasn't well been defined yet. Certainly in our hands, when we're dealing with the small vesicles, we see endosomal uptake is very efficient. And we don't see, panel G, the ability of small vesicles to directly fuse with the recipient cell membrane. But there is some evidence for some vesicles being able to do this. I think these are the larger micro vesicle type of structures where binding to the recipient membrane spontaneously fuses the lipid membranes together, and now you have the vesicle becoming part of the plasma membrane. 
And there's examples where you have constitutively active mutated proteins delivered by a cancer-derived microvesicle delivered to the um, recipient cell, um, and that is constitutively active, delivering new signaling capacity to the recipient. Panel C there is a little bit unusual where a vesicle can influence a recipient without actually having physical contact with it. So these vesicles carry bioactive enzymes that can chew up substrates and generate products. And the loss of the substrates, such as um, arginine or, tryp or tryptophan, for example, can be um, a big influencer for some T cells, for example or the manufacture of adenosine, again, can stimulate signal receptors in the recipient cell. Lots of ways for how cells can influence a recipient. So for me, I think there are three major application areas in this field, which are attracting a lot of interest recently. So understanding a bit of the nuts and bolts of the vesicles, how they're made, what's on them, how they operate, in microenvironments and beyond, really interesting for me as an academic. Um, but there are also more translational elements which are attracting interest. So maybe we can take a vesicle and manipulate it as a therapeutic agent in its own right. And there's some early studies from, I guess, the mid 2000s where this was being done in terms of immune modulation. There are other variants of that being done now. And of course, there's a huge interest in using vesicles or the information in the vesicle as a biomarker in various disease settings. So I think that's a huge field. And I think we're all struggling with it, actually. So let me just give you an example of vesicles mediating biology in cancer. Um, a common feature of solid tumours is that the stromal compartment becomes abnormally activated. So this is an example of a pair of needle biopsies from prostate cancer patients where the normal tissue is healthy and is predominantly these large open glandular structures surrounded by bundles of smooth muscle cells. And in disease, the architecture is completely collapsed. We see atrophy of these glandular structures. We see an infiltration of blood cells. And we see an altered interstitial stromal, where the stromal cells are basically wound healing like myofibroblastic cells. One way to generate these cells is to take a fibroblast or another precursor cell, stimulate it with TGF beta. And within three days, usually, you have the onset of these alpha smooth muscle actin stress fibers as a main feature of a myofibroblast being generated. Tumor cells load TGF beta onto the outer surface of their vesicles. How they do that, we haven't really fully worked out, but we do have some data detailing, detailing how TGF is tethered. And in panel A, we show here a fairly classical sucrose gradient fractionation of vesicles. So that cloud of colloid there in that tube contains the small exosomes. These float at a characteristic density of 1.1 to 1.2 grams per mil. And TSG 101 is um, one of the markers that we use commonly to discern vesicles of an endosomal origin. New information cast out as to how accurate that is as a marker for exosomes as opposed to small microvesicles. But clearly these things float at that density, and at that density we also have can measure TGF beta biolysis. So TGF beta is present as soluble dimers and also a proportion of it, about 20% of the total, is also present on vesicles. And if we take the vesicles from different tumor cell sources and add them to a luciferase reporter assay, if we have lots of TGF beta there, we get lots of luciferase activity. And some vesicles are very little TGF beta, such as the CACO2 and the LNCAP source. And these give us very limited luciferase activity in response. So it's exactly as you would predict. So we have three forms of myofibroblasts in this slide. So we have one form generated by soluble TGF beta, the other generated by vesicular delivered TGF beta, and the other myofibroblast is educated in vivo by the tumor environment. And if we compare the three myofibroblast types, we will see very easily that the vesicle type matches very closely the in vivo generated type of myofibroblast in that they secrete a whole bunch of proangiogenic factors. 
the classical soluble TGFP to generated myofibroblasts is a bit odd. It doesn't seem to do this. And in panel B, the soluble generated myofibroblasts are not really functionally active in terms of supporting um, angiogenic vessel formation in vitro. And when we put them in mice, panel C, Tumors alone is the red bar. They grow quite nicely, but if you put the myofibroblasts generated by vesicles in with those tumor cells, we get these very rapid, aggressive tumors growing. If we do this with myofibroblasts generated by soluble TGF beta, we get tumor control. It's really quite odd. It's the polar opposite of the myofibroblasts that are generated by the vesicles. So although they are genuine myofibroblasts, the nature of them is really quite different. So that's just one example of how vesicles in cancer can influence the environment and the progression of disease. And there's lots and lots of examples of how vesicles can influence varied aspects of tumor progression, including immune modulation, the formation of suppressor cells, the direct stimulation of antigenic um, activity, the dissemination of these small vesicles systemically to different organs and tissues, setting up the so-called metastatic niche. And also there's an emerging story where vesicles have a role in drug resistance, where drug may be encapsulated and expelled rapidly from the cells, so the lethal doses never reach the cells, survive the insult. And also more targeted therapies such as antibodies. Um, vesicles may also have these antigens and act as decoys for these therapies, so they don't work as well as we would like them to work. Another aspect is maybe using some of this ability, this natural capacity of, to, of vesicles to be disseminated and also to transit biological barriers. Can we use that in therapeutic applications? Well, this is early days for this type of work, I think, but lots of people have tried different ways of tagging vesicles with different agents in order to track where they go. So if you imagine labeling a vesicle with a fluorescent probe, well, exchange that for a drug, for example. So now you could have a drug-loaded vesicle and you could deliver that in a selective and safer way to your patient. So there's different ways of doing this. So you can load your drug into the intravesicular lumen um, with doxorubicin or calcine, for example. You could label nucleic acids in there. Most people to be honest, have employed a quick approach, which is labeling the lipids of the vesicle. And um, that works very efficiently as long as you're aware of some of the caveats of using some of these um, lipophilic dyes. They form nanomicelles and they can provide some misleading information. You could use fusion proteins. Tetraspanin is usually a good target for linking GFP to that. And one of the methods we've developed recently is simply use the sulfhydryl groups, which are present in abundance on vesicles, and attack those with malamide linked to alexidase. This gives us a very nice coating of the protein with fluorofluorous, and it's quick, it's easy, and it's very flexible. So this is two examples of that in action. So we take our purified vesicles, add a dye, and we spin them through a spin column. The dye retained by the column, the vesicles now labeled come out, and we add them to cells. So in the top panel, I have healer cells. These are classical fried egg-shaped epithelial cells. And you see here the very distinct puncture of vesicles which have been taken up into endocytic compartments. In the bottom panel, we had a lot of green channel autofluorescence when we were looking at primary fibroblast as a recipient cell. But it's very easy to deal with that. We just change the alexidine color. And now we can see um, very clear um, red dots being taken up by these live cells. Um, and we can track their entry and where they go over time. They tend to go towards the lysosomal compartments within a few hours, where we're assuming they're being degraded. But there's lots of details that you could use this type of technology for in terms of mapping the exact route of endosomal entry and the fate of the vesicle, at least the vesicle protein coat in this example. The other major application area, of course, is their utility as biomarkers of disease. And I think as a community, we are wrestling with a lot of very basic practical problems here in terms of how do we take a blood sample that will give us the best quality vesicles for our measurements and what are the variables 
that we are imposing on the sample, which may be degrading the quality of vesicle output in our assays. So this is a protocol that we developed. So I had a postdoc working with me, an excellent, talented young postdoc, Joe Welton, and she developed these complicated protocols for working with plasma and urine and prostate cancer. And it was a nightmare. So these protocols are clearly very complicated, cumbersome, time-consuming. For urine, we were dealing with 100 ml or so of volume, and we got good quality preps from urine, but plasma was still very difficult, even though this workflow here is very complicated. This is some data from plasma. So the blue bars there represent particle to protein ratio. So this is where our small vesicles are coming off a column, and the red line here represents the bulk protein in plasma. And then we have this co-isolation of CD9, CD81 with these particle to protein ratio measurements from the column fractions. And we have small vesicles coming off there exactly as we would like. But we also have contaminating lipoproteins in those, in those fractions and still a lot of protein which may interfere with the downstream assays. As I said, the urine was a bit cleaner. We could get some beautiful westerns with the urine, showing here these favorite vesicle markers of ours, Alex, CSG 101 and others, co-isolating with CD9. But again, one of the major abundant proteins in the urine is uromodulin or Tamhol cell protein, and a simple workflow with the column is not sufficient really to completely eliminate Tamhol cell protein from the specimen. So nothing's perfect, so you run with what you have. So this is a, um, a kind of shortened version of the workflow we're using with serum now. So we clean the specimen up, and then we're using a catch-detect assay for a marker of ours that we think is important in driving aggressive disease. So this assay applied to about 100 specimens so far clearly is giving us a good indication of histological severity. Um, but more than that, if we track progression in these patients, those with very aggressive disease progress very quickly. Um, those are the ones with high levels of marker X on their serum vesicles. So I think there's an enormous potential for using vesicles as disease biomarkers. And as a community, we are finding our way, finding little tricks of doing this to make it easier and cheaper. Um, certainly the assay I've shown you here beats PSA in terms of predicting progression. Um, so I think there's enormous potential for using vesicles in tumors and in other diseases. So before I finish, I'd just like to thank my colleagues locally in Cardiff who've helped set this up with me. So in particular, Susanna Tarby and Jason Weber who worked tirelessly on the Stromal story. Vincent Young and Rachel Errington and Alex Cox have been looking at um, uptake um, together with Professor Jones in pharmacy and Pete Watson. And we had a big community of people through a November funded project, both in the Netherlands, Belgium and Australia and Spain, working together to try and crack this workflow in relation to biofluid specimens, which we still haven't fully achieved, but it was great fun working with those amazing guys. So thank you for your attention, everybody. And I'll end there and I'll hand you back to Julia. Okay, so thank you very much, Alice, for this uh, presentation. So it looks like we had a few questions, so I'm going to let you answer. Well, thank you, Cell Guidance Systems, for putting the webinar together for us. I hope that was useful for the audience. We had um, one question from Roman, who was asking about the vesicle isolation protocol that we were looking at in relation to the in vitro study. Um, I showed a sucrose gradient isolation to demonstrate that TGF floats in the same place as vesicles. So the gradient method we use as an analytical tool here routinely, just to demonstrate that density relationship between protein of interest and vesicles. But in terms of the day-to-day -day preparation for the in vitro studies, um, we use a shortcut version of the gradient, which is a sucrose cushion method that's extensively published. It's in the current protocols manual, and it involves capturing vesicles in a small cushion of sugar, which is designed to be at 1.2 grams per mil. It's sugar in heavy water, otherwise you can't reach the density properly. 
um, and you spin the vesicles in there so you capture that sugar and you wash that sugar off and then you have a much cleaner specimen than you would otherwise if you were just pelleting and washing. So it's not as much labour as a gradient, it's not as clean as the gradient, but it gets you a tractable solution to giving good quality vesicle preps. In terms of um, questions, there's another one from Milen about which protocol for EVs in terms of blood. Now that is a million dollar question. I don't know. Um, I am aware that any protocol out there is balanced between the agony of handling the sample and the time it takes to do that versus the quality of the isolate. So your method depends on what you want to do with the product, how you're going to measure the vesicles. So for example, a really challenging question would be proteomic analysis of vesicles in blood. So for that, you need really, really good quality vesicle preps that are devoid of soluble protein and devoid of lipid proteins. And to date, a size exclusion chromatography gets you part of the way there, but you know that it's contaminated with lipid proteins. So Cecilia Lassa has published a lovely story where she's doing a two-dimensional fractionation. So she's based She's separating the first stage based on density on OptiPrep step gradient. She's scooping up the vesicles there and then she's putting them down a size exclusion chromatography column. So she's removing the liposomes and the soluble protein and getting really lovely vesicles out of the end, which are really good for high quality proteomic analysis. Everything else is really a compromise. Questions? So do you wash sugar with another round of ultrasonification PBS? Yes, so after the sucrose cushion step, you scoop up the mid-range of your sucrose cushion. So let's say the cushion is four mils, you take the middle two mils and a bit of that, and then you dilute that in about 30 mils of PBS, and you concentrate that by a pelleting step. Then you have a focused pellet of clean vesicles at the end of that. So in terms of vesicle labelling, we have a question here asking which method is more specific, labelling lipids or nucleic acid inside the vesicles. Oh, it's a really difficult question. I know the lipids, um, they're very quick win, they're very quick, um, they give very high quantum yield for your individual vesicle, but they do form these lipidic sorry, these dye aggregates, they're polar molecules, so they form these micelles. And the micelles are about the same size as the nanovesicles. If you do an NTA on just the dye, you will see a peak and it's highly fluorescent. So you have to be very careful in how you use some of these PKH dyes. Um, getting stuff inside the lumen of the vesicle and making sure it's trapped there and doesn't leak out is difficult. So we've used uh, some nucleic acid labels. Um, again, they're quite weak, they're not very bright and they're very difficult to track inside the cell. Hence our approach of just saturating the surface proteins with this malamide attacking the SH groups. That works really well. If you have protein aggregates there, the dye will also label the protein aggregates. So whatever you do, there's caveats and you've got to consider how clean the sample is and what you're actually labeling. So how, any ideas how to image EV uptake in vitro um, from Roman? Um, we, we do this all the time here and um, what you see depends very much on the phenotype of the vesicle that you're applying to the cell and the cell type that you're using as a recipient. Um, the lipid dyes, bearing in the caveat, work very well. The malamide dyes work very well. Um, and you just add them, you wash them and you, you see whether they have entered and transit through the endosomal pathway. And in essence, everything you do, you can get them into a cell with extraordinary efficiency. If you compare um, lipofectamine, for example, it's a really rubbish way of getting stuff into your cell compared to a natural vesicle. So it's very hard not to see EVs enter cells. In terms of Marina's question, how can I use vesicles as cancer biomarkers in liquid biopsy? You know, this is a huge topic area and thousands of people are working really hard on trying to crack this nut. The lovely thing about the vesicle is, of course, you have the protein coat. So you make, maybe grab it, 
if you're interested in colorectal cancer, you have a colorectal cancer specific protein, you can pull those vesicles out. And now you have an entity with lipids and nucleic acids for you to really profile in depth and give you information about that disease. You know, it's a million, there's a million different ways of doing this and the community are really struggling in bringing some consensus to this problem. How are we for time? Uh, I think two minutes left. So we just have, yeah. For one last question. Um, so Zaya's asked me, have I used a blood AccuTrap system? Um, I haven't, I, I think I'm quite old fashioned in my approach and um, Julia's gonna punch me in a minute, but I think the commercial, the commercial side, they bring all these wonderful products and it's quite a lot of effort to test them and to really rigorously put them through the mail to ensure that what the company says they're doing, they are actually doing. So I would recommend that you do that. So with any commercial product, be it AccuTrap or what have you, get hold of it and really test it. Is it really giving you the output that you expect? So being old fashioned, I try to go back one step and do things from a purist first principle point of view. And if the companies can come in after that and give you some shortcuts to your workflow, I really recommend that you take that approach. Um, so don't always believe what companies tell you. And now I'm waiting to- That was prepared. brave to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, I think it's over for today. It's been 35 minutes already. Thank you, everyone. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, thank you again, uh, Aled, for today. It was really nice. Um, so of course, the replay will be available at the end of uh, this webinar. So you could have access directly. We will send it to you by email. Um, so Cell Guidance System will try to do webinar related to exosome uh, every three to four months. So I hope you will be there. And if you have any other questions, do not hesitate to contact me. There is my email address again on the platform. So thank you very much and have a nice day or evening. Goodbye. Bye.